our guys can go in there and you could literally get, you know, 20 ABs against Verlander before you face Verlander. It's not doing us much good when we face him, but it, sure. it helps, you know, when, when we're seeing other guys. It's got to. Yeah. That's an amazing, wow, And dude. it's terrifying to stand in there and oh, see yeah. this. St- when you see this stuff popping out, you're like, holy shit. The, there's, I'm standing in the box when I did the demo and, and I know I'm not going to swing. Yeah. And when I see the first slider that pops out, I, I thought, I'm quitting. I'm out. This is, <laughs> it's good for me. Wait, can you program like 1990? seven randy johnson no because it has to be it has to be guys that were being captured by track man and at that time we gotcha. didn't have that. so you couldn't get 1993 north king county little league adam ray on the ninja turtles throwing his 41 mile an hour heater no but i'm guessing we generous. can still replicate something <laughs> yeah. like that <laughs> yeah. welcome back to the about last night podcast i'm your host adam ray thanks for listening to the show thanks for liking subscribing sharing with your friends your families your lovers your enemies your kids your kids kids Banger of an episode today, we have Jerry DePoto, the Seattle Mariners general manager, the man who has helped construct, build, uh, massage, manipulate, facilitate uh, the squad that we are currently rocking in our first pennant chase. Uh, World Series bound? Who knows? It looks good. It looks good on paper. It looks good on the field. Jerry has, uh, has done an unreal job with this organization and uh, his story into the bigs, becoming a GM. We talk a lot of baseball. Um, We talk a lot of Mariners. We have not been to the postseason in 20 years. It's the longest drought, postseason drought in major league, uh, in sports history, actually. Um, But we did about 90 minutes on this one. We could have talked for three and a half days. Uh, Jerry's the man, a great conversationalist, loves baseball. We covered every base. We laughed. We, uh, we got emotional. It's a it's a solid up, man. There will be a part two, part three for sure, with uh, with the man, the myth, the legend, Jerry Depoto. The guy's fifty four. He looks like he's twenty six. Um, <laughs> he's a uh, a great dude. Uh, and 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 what he did uh, in bringing over Scott Service, our uh, our manager, who he worked with in Anaheim, uh, is a really uh, wonderful uh, story as well. Their relationship uh, and how it transcends on and off the field. And just uh, the aura and energy that, that Jerry has helped, uh, you know, uh, create the winning culture in Seattle. It's awesome. We get into as much as we can in 90 minutes. It's going to feel like it, it flies by because uh, we just had such a good time. Um, he is on the Instagram. <laughs> he said to drag his kids. But uh, if you want to, you know, see what Jerry's up to, I don't know, go to the park, watch him watching the team like a pervert. You, you being the pervert, not him watching his team being a pervert. If you're watching, anytime someone's watching somebody watch something, I'm always like, hey, man, check yourself. Um, unless you're a kid watching another kid see uh, somebody take their top off at a pool for the first time. Because I, I've seen that, and that's, that's hilarious and awesome at the same time. My buddy's kid was 13, and we were at uh, a pool, and I saw him, saw him see boobs for the first time that weren't his mom's. And, uh, and it was incredible. I digress. Uh, I am in Dallas this weekend at TK's Comedy Club uh, tonight, Saturday, Sunday. Get your tickets at AdamRayComedy.com. And then I'm in Escondido at Grand Comedy Club next weekend. And then Labor Day, Tempe Improv, baby, where it all started, where I met my fiance, where I uh, first headlined in Arizona, um, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Uh, Actually, I'm sorry, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, because Sunday I'm going to the Emmys, baby. Woo-hoo! Pam and Tommy is nominated for 10 Emmys, and I'm going to that shit. And if we win, I'm storming the stage, Price is Right style. Um, all my merch, ticket info, adamraycomedy.com. Of course, Adam Ray Comedy on Instagram and Twitter. I'm posting clips on the social media day in and day out. Come out and see me. Tour dates, adamraycomedy.com. We start filming Young Rock this September. It comes back to NBC in November. Um, Vince McMahon has a nice storyline this season, so check that out. And I think that's it. Go Mariners. Go Storm. Go Seahawks, because we're getting ready for that to get going. Oh, God, fucking please pray for us. Uh, no, we'll be fine. And uh, enjoy the hell out of this episode with general manager of your Seattle Mariners, Jerry DePoto. Hey, it's Herbert. Mm-hmm. And you're listening to the About Last Night podcast, you slippery little son of a bitch.
Jerry DePoto here on the About Last Night podcast. Jerry, this is a fucking thrill. I have no guns, <laughs> let alone many guns, which would necessitate a gun rack. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, your subtle dry delivery just, threw me off. I'm doing my best, man. I'm I thought doing my that, best. I literally couldn't tell if that was a Wayne's World quote or if you were just trying to be like, I know your viewers probably don't want to know how many guns I'm actually carrying. And I was like, oh, and then I just tap back into, are you a big movie quote guy? Let's start there. Uh, occasionally. It yeah. just happens to be one of my favorite movie quotes. I, and I don't know why. It just stuck with me through the years. You know, no <laughs> alone, Cassandra. Uh, gonna, <laughs> yeah. I mean, game on. You know, yeah. there's, I mean, that's kind of a lazy quote. I'd say like, you know, little, yellow, different. I mean, when he's doing all the, uh, I don't know, what would maybe be my favorite Wayne's World quote? Ed O'Neill, when he's when they're following him to the through the diner, what do you remember what he says? No. Remember he's like walking in there. He's like he says something when he's about, doing the the Jimi Hendrix with the. No, it's Ed. O, you know Ed O'Neill. Yeah. Remember which one? Yeah, he's, yeah. He's, he's walking into the diner, and they they're like, Wayne quickly introduced him to him, and he's like, "You ever seen a like a." He's something about murdering a man or seeing a, like blood on a man's <laughs> hands. And then Wayne's like, okay. And then turns the camera away like, oh, yeah. A classic movie. I think that, that, I mean, that movie in general, probably the most, and this is going to sound on brand for me, but yeah. the most quoted movie for me is The Natural. Like, I, I'll Whoa. always quote the, the Natural. I've seen it a million times. Uh, that might be the first baseball movie that made me cry. I still cry when I watch it. Yeah. Sandlot, uh, Sandlot gets you misty eyed in a different way of just like maybe missing being a kid. Right. That's right. Um, what else? Major League. Major League made me cry. Major the League made me cry largely because I lived through the first version of my my very first Major League experience as a player was playing for the Indians in old Cleveland Municipal Stadium before Are you like the, the renaissance of the Indians. Yeah. It was a, so you felt like you were watching your. Yeah, this is my career unfold. That. Wait. So, yeah, you were. I got I got some notes here. Uh, yeah, you were, you, well, fuck, if I can't find it quick enough, you were drafted, uh, May 11th, 1993. My first, that was my first big league game. Yes. Yep. Okay. So you were drafted. 1989. 89. Great year. Um, what made 89 a great year other than I got drafted? It was a year before the Sonics drafted Gary Payton. <laughs> it was, I had my seventh birthday and I remember my friend's dad got drunk at my birthday party and wrote like poop dick on one of the my mom had this thing <laughs> where she got cups it was one of the kid birthday activities yep. it was like potato sack races and you know uh i think a pin the tail on the donkey or something which somebody just told me like they don't do that anymore now for whatever like pc cans i'm like jesus now they're taking away like uh, you know anyway so so and then there was writing your name on a cup so you could take it home with you like a real poor kid's birthday favor. I do that with my wine glass at a, at a party, you know. Great just, move. Yeah, yeah okay. Yeah. yeah. A little it's, initial. It's <laughs> a little initial. Yeah. Uh, JD. Yeah. And so so this uh, the dad wrote poop dick on it. And I thought it was hilarious at seven, which, which is probably why I'm a why comedian. Wouldn't you? Yeah. Why wouldn't you? Yeah. And uh, I remember some parents complained and a kid was walking around saying it and then it became like an issue. But... I remember seeing it and then hearing the kids say it, and I was like, man, pick your point. These are both very funny moments in my party. So that was 89. Um, that have lasted with you all these years since. Yeah. Can, can I drop a funny Please. Little, little quick? We sound good? Jerry on the mic good? Okay, great. Keep going. We have a uh, we, we have our son's third birthday party. I'm, at the time, I'm playing for the Rockies in yeah. Denver. Yeah. And, you know, all we've, we've a fairly young team. Everybody's got young kids. And, and Jonah, was he's our youngest. Mm. And he, he's turning three. So we have, like, the big birthday party blowout in the backyard. Yeah. You know, it's, a, it's scenic Colorado. We're oh, pressed man. up against the mountains. We've yeah. got probably, I don't know, like 50, you know, to, Teammates, you know, teammates, wives, their awesome. kids, everybody's running around in the backyard. And three's old enough to be able to, I think, enjoy, like... Oh, yeah, they're running around like yeah, mad they're men. They're loving it. Yeah, and, and, and they're on up to, like, my, my daughter's... My oldest daughter is... is four years older mm. uh, and then, then my son. So right. we are, you know, there, there's, there's kids ranging from three to seven or eight years old. They're running Fuck. around like crazy people. And we, uh, we hired someone dressed as Batman. Yes. To, to come and entertain the group, you yeah. know, with, yeah, with, with, with balloons and, and water gun oh, games, yeah. all kinds Jerry, of, I did it as Superman off Craigslist. We'll put a pin in that story. I got fired. Keep I, going. I can't wait to hear. 
So we, we have, I actually have a teammate, a former teammate who still brings this party up to this day because the there's, we're sitting around and like, like you do, we, we got our wine, we got our yeah. beer going, the kids are having their Loving fun it. and, and, uh, and Batman shows up. He doesn't fill out the costume. He, he weighs about a buck twenty, and and he chooses not to wear any underwear in, with the Batman costume. Get going. out! Oh yeah, so we had the. It was it was the topic of conversation was our our very frail looking and and not you know let's call it strapped version <laughs> yeah. of Batman running around in the backyard. Oh man, he's like, this is Robin. You're like, dude, <laughs> no, that's we just wanted Batman. Like, oh man, now and they don't give you like. Um, I'm sure you called, right? And then oh, you're yeah. like, hey, we've sent over Batman. It's like they need to start doing it almost like, you know, a dating app or some sort where you get to like swipe through Can and we see, see a photo? the different Batman. Let yeah. me see what I'm getting. That's right. One Pan down, please. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Can I get Batman who, you know, uh, you know, is is covered up? Can I get Batman who fills out the suit? Um, you know, maybe one that, uh, you know, knows the movie a little bit and isn't, you know, out there, you know, quoting, you know, the Godfather instead. <laughs> did, what, did, what did he bring to the table? What was his, I'll just take pictures. Roughly and, nothing. Yeah. Uh, other than the pure entertainment value of, of choosing not to, to wear any underwear and, you know, and not like really a, filling it out. I could just a, a real roll of the dice character choice. Yeah. He's probably, he probably was like, you know, yeah, I'm Batman. You can call me Darren. You're like, no dude, this We is... didn't even get the voice. He didn't even, <laughs> oh, no. we couldn't go there. Yeah. He just, is Talk. it cake gluten free? You're like, that's not one of Batman's catchphrases, dude. Uh, wow, dude. We still have footage all these many years later. For real? Yeah. Are you a big uh, a dad as far as like capturing the the moments from from the get go? You know, we do in the in the '90s when the kids were all small. Yeah. We did. We would you know, like a lot of other people at the time. We did like the handheld, and we oh, had the yeah, camera. Dude, we the went everywhere with oh, it. Yeah. Yep. And uh, after that, now we just you know snap something with the iPhone. I know. It's, it's, way it's, easier, it's, right? it's much much easier. Uh, now the same way that they will, um, you know, probably the your family, the kids, uh, your wife pull up uh old footage of parties and memories is there a time or holiday where it's like where you know you sit down on the couch got a drink you're like let's check out old dad's highlights from uh 93 the first game like do you ever pull up your old highlights no and 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 here's why so we when i was when i was finished or during the time i was playing yeah you know they, they would at the end of every year they would give you a vhs tape of your outings you know, the things that you did right yeah and, uh, you know, I kept the VHS tapes. And then later in my year, later in my career, I'm thinking, the hell am I going to do with these VHS tapes? So I had the video guy with the Rockies burn them to a DVD. Great. You know? And then it became, what the hell am I going to do with this DVD? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so, like, the technology kept passing along. So we have these DVDs burned, but now we don't have a DVD player. So it's a, uh, so they just sit there in a, in a this closet. This is what it transformed from there. But, yeah, okay. So you're, I saw recently, I think I might have even just, like, on YouTube, typing you in to see what pops up, and there's a great clip of you striking out service on a hanging slider. Oh, <laughs> yeah. And it's a, bro, I love that. You know the exact pitch, how hot it was. That was mostly because the players, you know, through the years, especially in the early years here with the Mariners, uh, would have our team meetings, our, our morning meeting. You, you'll have to come down and see it at Please. some point. Our morning meeting is, is it's it's Comedy Central for 25 minutes every day before the team leaves the clubhouse. And so break that down for me. A morning meeting consists of. So it consists of, you know, a given year we're going to have, let's call it 65-ish players yeah. to start spring training camp. Right. You know, the non-roster invites, the guys on the 40-man roster. And then we're going to have our, our coaching staff staff, our trainers, you know, send some of our front office personnel. Right. Every morning, the way we kick it off is, you know, Scott will sit in a, in a high, almost like a captain's chair <laughs> and uh, we'll go through what's happening on the field that day where everybody needs to be. And then we'll go through like some highlights at the very start of spring training. Uh, player, some player is is appointed the the news guy. Mm. Another player is appointed, you know, the, the weather guy. Right. Another, you know, so each one of these guys has to come up with entertaining ways to share the news or the weather or politics, awesome. whatever it is. And they'll spin around the room doing that. <laughs> and then we'll meet a teammate. So you will just stand up a random teammate in in the middle of the meeting, and Scott will interview the the that player. Yes. And sometimes they're hilarious. Yeah. Sometimes they're emotional. Yeah. You know? And uh, and all the times they bring a team closer together, 
And, you know, when, when the player will ask the player, what's your special skill, you know, and sometimes it breaks into the group karaoke sometimes it breaks into him getting on top of a pool table and going (laughs) through some kind of dance. And there's always something, you know, that you're not expecting. And it turns into like, it turns into like this uproar and it's like the room starts to riot and everybody's happy and runs out of the the room ready to roll, you know? So that's beef. That's on game days or that's for every day. Wow. Truly, we do it every day. We're in spring training for almost two months, and you have enough time to interview every player, you know, just doing one or two in a day. And, and uh, you know, my our first year here, that's uh, one of the players mm. put up the video of me striking out Scott and then kind of pimping off the mound. And and uh, and I yeah, said, yeah, really pimping, pimping off the mound after a hanging slider that he swung through. And he's MFing me all the way back to the oh, dugout yeah, thinking, dude. how did he get away with that? Oh, yeah. That's what a brilliant move to. I mean, and you know better than anyone, and especially like this team that we're watching right now. And, and when you came to my show at the Paramount and we were talking after and I was like, let me know if I'm talking too much baseball to you. Because when I even first met Rick Riz and we went out and played pool to like two in the morning in Issaquah and we were talking so much baseball and I was like, hey man, if I'm being like the guy at the bar right now that's like, remember Tino Martinez when he fucking, you know. And I do. Like, <laughs> yeah, exactly. And he's like, I do. I was there and, and he loves it. And you were telling me the same thing. You're like, I love yeah. it. It's not just my job, but it's like, it's truly, and, and, and especially you know, I think a little different from Riz from being a player and now into this position. You can't do it if you don't love it. Um, but I, I can see why there might be times when you're like, I just want to break from it, right? Just like any person you want, like I'll, I need nights off from doing stand up just to be a person and hit the reset button. I don't even know if that's possible in your world as a GM to take because there is, and even in my world, there's always something to yep. check if there's a, a booking for something, an audition I got to do tomorrow, last minute. So even in your world, uh, are there times for you to like just step back and take the foot off the off the pedal? So it's one of the things I've learned in recent years. Yeah, it's a, first like at the the idea that this is what I do, not who I am. There's a point where that intersection, just, you can't avoid it. Yeah, because we've been doing this for so long, and it truly is. It's a lifestyle. You're, you're doing it every day of the year. There are no Saturdays and Sundays. Every day is Monday. Mm. And, you know, the somebody will, I was talking to a former teammate of mine uh, just on Sunday, mm. standing in the, the box over in Texas, walking around in the pregame, just talking, you know, about things that had happened years ago. And he, and he said, hey, call more often, bro. And I said, this is it. This is my 20 minutes yeah. off today. And, right. And there's always something and the off season starts and, and just blends in with roster building and the regular season comes around. So a couple of years ago, I, I, I kind of really identified that I need some time. So I, I, I block out about two hours every morning, you know, from like seven to nine where, where that's, that's the time to do me and, and, nice. you know, just stay kind of grounded a little bit, get my workout in and, and do something not baseball yeah. just to stay sane. Is there a guilty pleasure show you'll put on in the background to like truly zone out like some uh, Dr. Pimple Popper or some Finding Bigfoot or There's none of them that are crazy like yeah. guilty pleasure yeah. but we watch it like right now we're in on uh, well a Better Call Saul The Breaking Bad <laughs> way in on that Yeah, um, we're watching uh, Murders in the Building and, yeah. which Incred- is hilarious incredible yeah. Martin Shore just won some uh, uh, Hollywood Critics uh, Choice Award for it I mean uh, he's a, it's brilliant it, it's, it really the show is, is brilliant yeah. it, and it's seemingly it, it could go on forever Yeah, it, it's so you know we're into that that and and roughly I'll do you know if there's nothing going on baseball wise I'll do something you know just so whatever my wife wants to do mm. you know Tam your time you tell me what you want to do and, yeah. and she'll pick it is there this might seem like a uh, you know dumb question but is there are you able I definitely have become more critical just watching movies after having you know been fortunate enough to do some and and then just just be the thicker you get into the business um you just have a more critical eye, right? So, like, can you separate, like, sitting at the game? Like, when I saw you at spring training and it costed you, and you were like, you know, back away, man, and, uh, you know, six feet. And I was like, oh, we're through the pandemic. You're like, it's still six feet. I can tell that you, you know, you're, you're on something right now. And, uh, and uh, you know, there is a enjoyment of the game, I think, that you still have that is really cool, which is, I think, why it's bleeding into the team, you can definitely tell, you know? And like you just said with your morning meetings and trying to, have uh, constantly building camaraderie and keeping things light. I heard you say on the radio a few weeks ago about Carlos Santana coming in and and uh, the dances on the field started maybe a day after. You said this veteran guy that not only is bringing his bat and his experience, but that business can be a very, uh, uh, baseball can be a very business as usual sport, you said. 
and tell me if I'm misquoting you, but that Carlos was like, you still got to enjoy, when you win, you don't like fucking, you know, paint the town and like, you know, go to Vegas for a night, Jordan style or Italy, wherever he was, you know, gambling, golfing and turn things up. But you celebrate because baseball is tough. You said he said, right? Yeah. It's, and that's what Carlos brought to our team. Yeah. He, he reminded the guys, you know, winning is hard have fun with it, you know, and, and so we started that night, you know, the team started celebrating the victories and, you know, they'll do it on the field with their little dance yeah. and, th and then post game, they'll go into the clubhouse and they do a players only get together and they celebrate the, the win. However, they're going to celebrate it, toast it, you know, pour water on awesome. each other, whatever, and know that they're coming back the next day. Have you ever seen that or been around that? Is that like just on a whole for baseball, it can get very monotonous, like don't get too high, don't get too low, right? Everyone preaches that, I feel like. hundred percent. I, I mean, I, I remember, you know, uh, in the 90s, in, in my playing years, yeah. you would go play against the Braves, and it felt like 25 guys walking in, putting down their briefcase, grabbing their time card, punching in, wow. beating your ass, and then grabbing their, <laughs> their briefcase and walking back out. You know, and, and, and the, our team, and this is maybe the thing I enjoy most, it's a... They, they love what they're doing. You can see it. They're young and they're energetic. And every guy that walks through that door, especially this summer, but really it started last year, but especially this summer, the, the guys that walk in for the first time, it, they're blown away with how much fun this team has playing. Yeah. And, and I've heard from so many of the guys that have, have joined our team in the last two years, we'll say, that they say, this is my favorite place I've ever played. And who that, who would have guessed that, you know, five, eight years ago? Does that make you like a proud dad in a way where you're just like, like I don't yeah. know. I mean, like, I'm not, you know, I'm a, I'm a dog dad, but like the, I mean, the amount of like, for a guy to say that, like, that's so crazy. It's to me, amazing. I think it's that, a, that there's, you've created a culture here that, um, because at the end of the day, and like my stepdad, George, who, uh, who gave me a handful of questions to ask you, we'll see if we'll get to any of them. He, uh, but he just told me again, to thank you for everything. He's never been more into baseball in his entire life. You know, he's pushing 80. He is obsessed with the Mariners and like, you have to acknowledge at some point, and I'm sure you do, like the uh, what what the city what the city has become, and the baseball is one of those sports where it's like when things do change, especially a squad like you know ours that's been so you know just desperately waiting for the tide to turn. You, f I mean, it's like I'm in like nine different text chains. Um, for every and and it's now you know it's a little aggressive because games every night where we're like texting throughout the game and I haven't ever had that you know what I'm saying like and that's pretty special um, there's got to be multiple examples like that that you're now feeling or hearing or people stopping you right like oh yeah, yeah. it's a and right now you feel like the city vibing and yes. the players feel it yeah they do yeah you know we actually had one of the the guys from the Yankees and I, I don't want to out him yeah. but one of the guys from the Yankees turned around and said to to one of our players I've never played in an environment like this it's the New York Yankees wow. and, and uh, a veteran player. He said, I've never played in an environment like this. This is unbelievable. He said, I, I, hopefully we're back here in October. This and, was during the last homestand. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, we, we, the way our fans have shown up when, you know, and, and I want to say we crossed a bridge mm. last September mm. and, and I, I think, built a trust with the fans. And then we got off to a pretty crummy start this year, generally speaking, sure. for the first six weeks we were down. And once we started to trend again and the fans rolled out, the, when they bring it, it is, it's the most electric environment that you can imagine. And, you know, which Jesse Winker dubbed, you know, the electric yeah. factory yeah. and, and the, 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 the environment that we play in night after night with, you know, a fun young group who show their personalities every night. Like you don't need to, to guess who the guys are. Yeah. They show you every night. That's, that's what's crazy. That's fun. So you can, so back to, I guess I never asked it uh, directly, but you can, you can watch the game with your GMI, but also as a fan. Yes. Like you can. Awesome. Yeah. As a, like, and as a matter of fact, like in spring training, I'm watching a game more as a scout, you know, when I'm watching a game upstairs, sitting in the in the booth, more as a scout, you know. When we open up the windows and we're playing the Yankees and it's the 11th inning, I'm throwing my hands in the air just like every other awesome, you know knucklehead dude. out there, and I'm screaming and I'm high fiving the people around me, and because it's that's that's why we do what we do. We love doing it, and yeah. you know, and and I'm you know I'm particular. I like being myself, just like they like being them. I let it hang out. We were texting about after that game, and you said. I think again, and I was texting with Goldsmith too, who was like, that was the greatest game I've ever called. Yeah. Cause I told him, I go, you had some awesome calls during this game. And I, and I just also thanked him. I was like, bro, I'm just glad you're on our side. Like you're, he does a phenomenal job. He's incredible. Yeah. And yeah. it's just like, you know, you get, 
being someone that just grew up in and listened to Dave and Rick, you get very particular about anything to do with your team. It's almost like, you know, probably a parent when a kid starts to date their kid. You're just like, fucking, you, you better be wearing underwear, Batman, you know? And so, uh, and so you know, here and Aaron uh, just kind of grow on you, but also find his own way uh, has been really cool. And he had a... I think I told him one call in particular on that night where he was just like a guy, I can't remember who it was, might have been Donaldson, and he was like, what a wacky swing, or what a, yeah. It, it was just such a way, but he's got so much enthusiasm, yeah. which is another thing, too, that, like, you talk about the players can't hide it, you know who they are. The guys in the booth, everyone, I feel like, is is just, like, can't, um, uh, no one's immune to just being uh, very vulnerable and, and raw with the emotion of what the game is providing. Uh, so so you were telling me, though, that was in a I think you said maybe one of the greatest games you've ever seen. It's the it is the best regular season game I've ever seen. Like you will see games that have that kind of drama that you know the, the that make you feel that way yeah. in the postseason. You will never experience that in the regular season. Like in in just that way with you know forty plus thousand fans engaged and two heavyweights just throwing punches and and you expect one of those heavyweights to be the Yankees, but I don't know how many people really expect the other heavyweight to be the Mariners. Yeah. And, and now it's our turn. I think that's you know? what you said. It was like Castillo, Garrett Cole, Luis Castillo, Garrett Cole. You're going, each of them went, I think, seven, eight, uh, 40,000 plus. On, was it a Wednesday or a Tuesday? Uh, I think it was a Wednesday. Was so good? also crazy. Oh, Tuesday. It was yeah. Tuesday. M's, Yanks, night game, August. It's like you have all the... Uh, the the uh, the makings for a like epic match and it was yeah that was bonkers and, and also the, you don't get those with the new guy on second extra innings like we usually don't get them to to, to the thirteenth nobody I yeah. mean it's just getting to that point with scoreless games and the extras is crazy but the physical stuff that was coming out of guys hands yeah. in that game we we went the there was not a fastball thrown under 95 miles an hour until the 163rd fastball in the game. No way. Yeah, it was it, it's just insane how many like just blow it up fastballs were were being thrown and it wasn't like they were 98 and straight. Right. I mean, they were moving like snakes and they were being located like crazy and the first thing you think of like my god, it's hard to hit, you know? <laughs> oh yeah. Uh, well, you I mean, tell me this real quick. I mean, throwing heat, receiving heat. I think I watched, there was a documentary called Fastball. Is it on Netflix? Yeah, yeah, yeah. About, I think it was like 95 and up, you're just guessing? Yeah. Would you have almost no time to make your decision? And what the fuck? You know, I think the the big thing. I'm you guessing know, on 62 in the cage at Fantasia. Right. Like, what is 90, like. And so we, we have a pitching machine now that's, uh, and you, you come down and see it one day. But it's, yes. we have a pitching machine now that, that it, it replicates the physical stuff that any pitcher in the league throws because we have the data to do it. So, you know. Wait, what? Oh, yeah. It's amazing. And, and you can physically or visibly see, like, if we program in Justin Verlander, it'll, the, 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 the machine will start to shift, you know, like the, 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 the optics of the machine start to shift the hole where the ball comes out shifts up because Verlander Verlander's a taller guy. And then the pitch shapes are all programmed to exactly Verlander's pitch shapes with using the data from TrackMan. So, you know, it's a, <laughs> It's amazing. Our guys can go in there and you could literally get, you know, 20 ABs against Verlander before you face Verlander. It's not doing us much good when we face him, but it, sure. it helps, you know, when, when we're seeing other guys. It's got to. Yeah. That's an amazing, wow, And dude. it's terrifying to stand in there and oh, see this. Yeah. When you see this stuff popping out, you're like, holy shit. There's, I'm standing in the box when I did the demo and, and I know I'm not going to swing. Yeah. And when I see the first slider that pops out, I, I thought, I'm quitting. I'm out. <laughs> this, is, this is good for me. Wait, can you program like 19? 97 Randy Johnson. No, because it has to be it has to be guys that were being captured by Trackman and at that time we gotcha. didn't have that. So you couldn't get 1993 North King County Little League Adam Ray on the Ninja Turtles throwing his 41 mile an hour heater. No, but I'm guessing we generous. can still replicate something <laughs> like that. <laughs> That's crazy. How many things like that are uh man, necessary for uh for the team's preparation? Are you are, are you involved also in in that side of things, or is that more a like Scott and the and his staff as far as like making sure the team is provided with all the like is like with the Seahawks? I you know it's the way you see all the players looking at the iPads after. I even just I didn't know that they have that in baseball too. Last night's game, which congrats, unbelievable. Yeah, go figure. Right? That was uh, a wild night. Swagger dude lives on. Yeah, <sighs> dude. The um, yeah, that was awesome. Fire I mean, again, like you said, like the, the cutting to him in the dugout. Everyone like 
everyone I feel like would be hugging each other on every play if they could, but you're just trying to keep some level of like, that's right. Let's like, you know, Julio will hug everybody, every play, but totally. the, the rest of them, they, they, they picked their spots. I saw him looking Julio in the dugout at an iPad, I think reviewing the, um, a play. So I didn't know that was an option. That's awesome. How much of that stuff do you, um, is it your job or do you uh, like to be involved in to make sure they have everything they need to, to do their job? Yeah, no, that's that that's kind of my job is, is making sure that all of that is available. Like the pitching machine that I just described, yeah. it's a, you know, the company that produced it, they, they reached out to a handful of what were believed to be maybe the more progressive teams. Mm. And, you know, we connected with them and became a first mover in using the machine. And, you know, it's, a, it, it's, it's pretty, it, it's, pretty complicated yeah. you know it's not just the mechanics of the machine it's all of the 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 data that goes into programming it and uh you know one of the one of the the things we've prided ourselves on is making sure that we're never short on the tech that we're never short on those little advantages yeah. that you might be able to gain and you know and years ago you know when we first got here scott and the staff we, they would have to adapt because the the coaches in particular when they played nothing like this existed and and it takes an open-minded you know i guess teammate because you need to engage your analysts you need to engage your sports scientists mm. and your trainers and and your front office people and in, in, in reaching this and and 25 30 40 years ago that never happened yeah. you know it was just it was the manager the coaches and the players and that's that wow now it's the you know i call it the village it's a, now it's the village everybody chips in to make sure that we're doing all the right things and you need so it's a very collaborative effort very. on most um was this you know we spoke right before the trade deadline um is that as chaotic of a time for you as it feels for the fans the players i don't know who actually feels most stress i mean players there's got to be some that always know uh, I'm safe, right? Like, I'm sure nobody was like, oh, we're going to maybe Julio might be on the block. You know, fuck no. We talked about too, and I want to hear that your story that you told me at the uh, Paramount about uh, finding Julio. But um, is that so? Is there a time in your life that's equivalent to how stressful the trade deadline time is? I think it's a blast. You know, really? it's a, yeah, I love it. The, my, my first opportunity as a GM was in 2010. Uh, there's, we had, we had a big shift in the organization they let the then general manager go. We were, I was with the diamondbacks. Yeah. I was the VP of, of, um, of scouting roughly player. Personnel. With the diamondbacks you were. Yes. Was that your real quick? So once you retired, you were like, I'm, I want to stay in the game. Yeah. Yeah, and you retired with like literally walked across the, the field and went to work in the front office the next day. So you retired a Diamondback. I uh, retired a Rocky. A Rocky, yeah. And then went to work in their front office. Gotcha. But yeah. so you just you just knew. And is that consistent with most players that want to stay in the game with some? No, most of them just walk away. They go play golf for a while, yeah. and then and then they may call back in two years or Being four years. Or and hey, you know, can I get involved in some way? Yeah. And and you know what I always tell players now is don't let the door close. You know, it's just find a way to stay tethered. Because if, if you are connected, oh, yeah. it's it's really tough to to engage six, eight years down the road and say, hey, remember me as a player? I want to get back in. Oof. Well, you know, the game's changed a lot. Yeah, since look you at played. like Danny Wilson and, and Blowers, how quickly they stayed. Yep. And, and it's like you keep, we're, we're always still like, oh, yeah, anytime because, yeah, the They're timeline. Tethered, you know? yeah, and there was a, 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 a not a huge gap in between them stopping and, and continuing. And and it's a, and like we said earlier, it's a lifestyle. You yeah. know, so, you know, Dan Wilson... He is, you know, he can coordinate with our minor league catchers. He goes out and, you know, periodically manages one of our minor league teams for oh, a wow. three or five day stretch to give somebody an off, you yeah. know, a little break. Yeah, yeah. He comes to spring training. Now he's doing broadcast. You know, years ago, Dave Valley, Val, when yep. Val retired, he went right in and was minor league manager. Yeah. And then thought, ah, this, this broadcast gig seems like a yeah. thing. So he started doing that. And, and it's a, and you Griffey's just keep now, uh, what is his role with the, he, d he is the the special the special advisor to the franchise. Gotcha. Right. I guess um, it's he works most closely with our ownership group. Okay, cool. He's now a member of our ownership group. That's great. Um, right? And yeah, you know, he and it's a it really is fun when he comes around. You want to talk about great stories? Really, Junior's got great stories. Re well, yeah. I, I assume so. But I, yeah, I guess I that's I love that you're saying you've heard some of them because some people we all know them just have lived a crazy life. And either they aren't a great recounter of the tales, or they just are like. Oh, he's one of the best storytellers I've ever been around. Oh, that's unbelievable! Yeah. Uh, is it, it, the and, and that come to mind that you have any footnotes on that you're like? 
I mean, I mean, some of the things he, he has a he has in the past. He take he takes part in this like almost like a great race. It's a it's something global. They'll get. He was telling me about it in in Japan mm. when we were over there to open up yeah. the, the series with uh, Oakland. Yeah. And he said, yeah, in the off seasons, I do this, you know, I do this race where it's a, you know, it's, it's people from around the world of entertainment. You know, there's a, he said, but on up to like, there's, there's a, a Saudi Arabian prince. There's a, Holy like, shit. and what they, they, they have, they have cars that are specially prepared. You know, like I asked him, what do you drive? And he said, he said, I had like a supercharged range, range Rover. <sighs> and, and I said like, what's supercharged mean? He said, think about like a range Rover with a, with a, the, like a Lamborghini's engine. Oh my and, God. and, uh, they will, they will just be you know, the master of the game sends them a location and they know the, the start date and they have to be there with their car at that location on that day. And then they have an end point and there's no direct travel route they just have to get from london to tokyo in x number of days <laughs> and you know so that, that it's it, it's on it's like the cannonball run yeah and, and he's like walking me through step by step you know driving through czechoslovakia and the, like he's yeah and then we're running through prague and, he, and he's and he's like giving the detailed breakdown oh, and then man. you know drop in some of the people who are involved in this race and you're like no way this is a, this sounds insane this the, is the something cast is just yeah. insane yeah and the, the but it's it's such a cool thing and and i it's I know like him, Wolfgang Puck, Elton John, fucking like, Beavers, <laughs> all the biggies, yeah, right? The biggies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> wow, yeah. That's I, you always hope that uh, guys like that that gave you so much, like, are doing cool stuff. Because I see him every now and then. I guess on you know up in the booth or whatever, and you can get, and he's not on social media, so, so that's one way to get tricked into being like. I hope Griffey's having a good life. You know, I hope he's out there doing fun. Oh, shit. I think he's Sound, doing. Yeah, he's doing, uh, he's fun doing stuff. it. Yeah, he's yeah. taking advantage. Um, Okay, so so I love that. So you walked right over. You get with the Rockies. Do you get? Do you immediately find a bug for? You strike me as someone who's always had a knack for this side of things. Yeah, like, this is. Yeah, I did it when I was playing. You know, as oh really? Yeah, I, oddly enough, where as a player, you know, the way they used to do scouting reports, they used to just do these little three by five cards. You know, information cards, and that's how they scouted. He a sucks. Player. He's good. Yeah, pass fastball <laughs> X, curveball yeah. Y, yeah. and and uh, you know, over time it evolved. Well, by the late '90s, you know, mid late '90s, they they had like a pamphlet. It was like a three page report on a player. Yeah, and um, and the way the Rockies did it in those years is they would pass out the pamphlets for each of the the major league players mm. to their major league coaching staff. So they're asking, you know, the National League, they're asking the coaching staff to evaluate the National League. And, you know, our then bullpen coach gave me his packet and he said, you pay more attention to this shit than I do. Can you do it? And I said, yeah, love to. And I literally sat there for part of the summer of that, that, that second year I was in Colorado, part of the summer of 1998. I'm having maybe the best year of my career. Mm -hmm. And I'm sitting in a little room uh, behind the bullpen with, you know, pieces of the fence, the, the, the extra, yeah. you know, yeah, yeah. portions of the fence sitting back there on, on a couple of bags of, of, uh, diamond dry with a little desk made up of the, the fence. And I'm writing up scouting reports like six or eight a night on the other oh guys in the national God. league. So then the day I retired, I naturally gravitated, you know, my interest was mostly in, in scouting and roster building. And, and then it evolved into, you know, a more, you know, a more acute, desire to get involved in, in player development and, and then switching, you know, changing directions and programs, trying to modernize systems, you know, came later. And, and then I'd say, you know, right about the, you know, just before I got to Seattle I, is when I really started to get the itch or, or, or want to know more about analytics. And, mm. and what I found then, you know, I had some operational, you know, uh, capability in yeah. the area. And what I realized then, it doesn't matter how much you know about, you know, analytics, it matters how much the people that you hire to work with you now know about right. analytics. And then you just trust them to do their thing. Wow. And when they say yes or no, you ask them why, and then you say, okay, because you know, yeah. they're almost always right. It's kind of what was going on with Moneyball, right? Like exactly. The, did you, um, was that kind of, uh, that, did that happen well? No, that was post you were playing. Or yeah, this playing? was a, that was after I was playing. I was actually working in the front office when Moneyball came out, so yeah. I was I was working in scouting. Yeah, was that it? I mean, that was a pretty you know um, giant splash of a way to do things, right? The Definitely, that, yeah. and it was really controversial at the time totally. in baseball circles. Would you guys? It, uh, yeah, so you guys would talk about. I mean, it would 
Oh, uh, scouts get- would bitch about it all the time. Wow. And, and, you know, it would be, it, we, for instance, I was a- actively out scouting at the time. And, and, you know, you'd get around the guys who'd been doing this for decades. And, and they were really uh, offended to the point where I think if you just polled the scouting community, 95% of them were, were anti Oakland A's at the time. Like, wow. I hope they fall on their face, these clowns. And, you know, and then, and then over time, that just kind of went away as more and more teams started to, adopting these, sure. you know, these concepts. Yeah. A little bit of it is I'm sure insecurity of like, I hope this new way doesn't like, and cause you're so set in your way. Uh, and like then we talked about with the coaches, you yeah. know, nobody likes to change. Yeah. The there's, how do you feel just in general about the uh, improvements, upgrades, changes in the game? You know what I'm saying? Like even putting somebody at second to start extras, or yeah. I know there's a pitch clock now next year, right? Yep. Is that, which I think is needed. Totally. Uh, yeah. Um, do you, are you someone that's like old school baseball, like keep the game, nothing ch- like you, sh- you know, or are you like, Hey man, let's get that rock and jock fucking nine run ball from MTV that Frank Thomas hit. Let's put it in the game every third game. Like, are you open-minded like that? Or is it like within reason? Open-minded. Cool. I had to, so in 2012, uh, I became part of the, the MLB rules committee. So, awesome. you know, I, I sit on the MLB rules committee and Whoa. it's a, it's, I, it was a really cool thing. I kind of inherited it when I got to the angels, uh, Bill Stoneman, who preceded me by about, I don't know, four years mm-hmm. as the angels GM, uh, Stoney was still there as a, as a consultant. And for the four years in between, you know, my tenure and his, uh, he he continued to serve as a member of the rules committee right. and then he retired and, and, uh, he passed the torch on to me and I, I picked up and, and in the, the year since now it's been 10 years and you know, whatever, 11 years. And, uh, and I feel like I'm always at the, at the ground level of mm-hmm. what's coming next right. because we're not trying to determine whether it's a good idea to, you know, to paint the, the, the chalk, mm-hmm. you know, the, 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 the fair and foul poles <laughs> right. being in play or right. out of play, whatever, yeah. you know, we're talking about what's going to make the game more, you know, interesting in the future, totally. how to make that. Uh, it's, I, and, and I, that was maybe one of the most rewarding things I've done outside of just team building is, you know, it's, we, we as part of that, I spun off and I, and I became a member of the, the, um, on field committee. And for about three years, you know, now it's, it, you, you have, a, a group of, of former players, mm. a group of owners, a group of front office personnel and an umpire, uh, is, is what the, the group was made up with. And you, you get together at the winter meetings every year or at the GM meetings and you sit down for this three hour epic meeting Sure, and it's John Smoltz and it's Derek Jeter and it's, you know, it's, it's, Tom Werner. It's like you're who? sitting down with the the the, the who's who <laughs> yeah. in, in baseball. Joe Torre. Guys and that it's you want Jim throwing Leland. in their ideas and, exactly. uh, and how the game should continue. Because it should evolve, right? Every, That's right? I mean, entertainment, comedy. I mean, it's like things got to, it's just, you know. You have to modernize. It's yeah. a, you know, the, the I, I think what we're doing in baseball right now, and it's happening at a much higher speed, for about 120 years, there was virtually no change. You know, once they once they got the mound to 60 feet, six inches, and started throwing overhand, there's been subtle change, but it's mostly the same game. Yeah. You know, and then, you know, beginning in the, the mid-90s when they introduced, you know, that now it was three divisions instead of two. Now it was, a you know, the, the implementation of a wild card. Yeah. That's when the pace started to pick up, and that's when fan interest really started to, to escalate. I really loved when the ALNL, like – would play each other. Yeah. That was to me like a, That's it was it. almost like when Steve Urkel guest starred on full house, you're like, dude, Bam. We're he's not supposed to be there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right? But it was exciting, right? It was exciting for the players too. Yeah. You know, I, t- I remember cause I was playing when we first, you know, oh, started in- interleague play. Whoa. Tell and me as a player, when you hear that news, is it like, I mean, Oh, I- you were jacked because we, I, I had spent, you know, I was six years in the national league. I started in the American league. But then I spent the next six years in the in the National League, and you always play in the same city. You think I'm never going to get to see Yankee Stadium? Or yeah, never to... again. You know, and 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 then when they announced that, I actually was fortunate enough to play in the very first you know game, the 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 first interleague no game. No way. And it was uh you know just some really cool experiences and things you didn't think of. But when we started introducing those things, fan interest really escalated. Yeah, and, and to me the. 
the evolution of the game should be driven by the fans' interest. What do the fans want to see? Because in the end, that's the game. You know, it's and you're spot on with that. I mean, hey, I mean, I still get fired up for the hat trick. Never gotten it. You know, booze might be a factor. <laughs> <laughs> you can't. You also can't blink. Have you ever gotten the hat trick or so the hydro? A, I, I think it's. I never really pay attention to the yeah, hydro. Yeah, I gotta okay, be honest. Yeah. But the, the the hat trick. We the first time I ever saw the hat trick was in the kingdom. You know? No way. Yeah, I was here. I was playing with the Indians, and you know, I'm sitting down in the bullpen. It's my rookie year in the big leagues, and you know, in the minor leagues, they don't have big fun scoreboards. No. you know, it's a, it, everything is much smaller. It's scale. more like there's a, a white four to escape in the uh, part. Right. I mean, that's I don't right. Know, what are please they doing? turn your lights out. Yeah, please you know? turn your lights off. Yeah. So we, we uh, we're sitting in the kingdom, and they put up the first time I ever saw the hat th- the hat trick, and I thought, no way. This is, <laughs> so you'd wind up sitting there, and then they slowly start. I think the Mariners were the first ones to introduce that. Cool. And, and then it started to permeate the rest of the league. And th- at that time, it was so new that all of us would sit down in the bullpen, and you're like, dup, 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 dup. one, it's one. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, it's not one. You yeah, do it. Yeah. You're crazy. It's two. It's hey, two. Yeah. Yeah. I used to say, this is anybody watching the hat trick. Ready? All right, here we go. Here we go. <clears throat> Fuck! <laughs> yeah, yeah, you yeah. just guess. Yeah, just, just guess. guess. Yeah, yeah. I think it's two. Yeah, the um, yeah, you guys do. I mean, and I'm sure, uh, you know, that's not something you're on the day to day with, you know, because it's more team focused. But it's gotten to a really fun place. I mean, the game experience oh, at yeah. T-Mobile is, and I'm sure you do take pride in that, right? It's like you're you've help build the whole reason we're here. So why shouldn't you also want like, it's like you're hosting a party in a way. I don't know. Do you walk into the stadium and, and take a sense of pride? And like, when you see people having a good time, you're like, fuck, all right, I'm somewhat responsible for this. When I worked at Universal Studios and played Wolverine, uh, ladies, and, uh, <laughs> and I would, uh, you know, when people would have a good time coming all over for a vacay, I'm like, man, I have a chance to be a part of their whole like vacation and for better or for worse, you know? And um, I got to assume that there's something like that with you, with seeing people at the park. You see a kid maybe get a ball for the first time, or you can probably tell there's a first family going to a game, driving from fucking Kent or, you know, somewhere where nobody should be living, you know, like, you know what I'm saying, though? Do you have those moments? <laughs> I have them every day. Yeah. It's a, and, and truly, like, our Marcom team, Kevin Martinez, our, it, he yeah. kills it. Yeah. You know, the, the, the on-field team, Camden Finney, yeah, you know, Trevor. She, she does an amazing job. Our, Trevor yeah. and our ballpark ops group. Yeah. It's a, it really is an awesome experience going to the, the ballpark. And, and uh, one of the things, and that are the, the guys, they used to bust my balls about yeah. this a lot in their early years in spring training. You know, I wouldn't say much at the, the, the first meeting of the year. You know, it's a introduce the the staff, make sure everybody knows who, you know, the, the resources you have. This is our training staff. These are the guys in the front office. This is, you know, these are the analysts. Mm-hmm. Here are the people that are here to support you, to the players. Right. You know, and, and the only thing I would say to them is that I had two things that I really would drill home. So we got 63 players in the room. We're going to need everybody to chip in if we get where we want to go because not it's not going to be 25, now 26 guys. It's You need everybody to chip in wow. and, uh, and, and just make sure that the theme is we're all in this together. Yeah. And then the other one is, guys, somebody's going to be at the ballpark today who's never been to a ball game before. Some kid is going to, is going to be out there who's never seen a baseball game before. You know, when, they, when they're asking you for autographs, when they're asking you for the, for the photo, the selfie, find a way to say yes. Just, just do it. And, and that's kind of the message. And then for the first couple of years here, one of them, Nasu Cabrera, who throws oh, yeah. batting practice for us. Yeah. And, uh, Nasu still every day when he sees me, he says, yes, <laughs> yes. You know, but, uh, yeah. the guys would oh, probably, Hey, you know, yeah. just find a way, yeah. find a way guys. Yeah. There's so many, I mean, I've been going to M's games. I used to take the bus down in seventh grade to the kingdom with my buddies. We'd meet at the Albertsons in Lake Forest park. I was working at, we'd meet in the parking lot. We'd take the bus down a straight shot from LFP to the kingdom, get off a couple blocks away take it back at like 11 get back at like 11 30 and then one parent would pick us up we'd get you know poster board whatever make a sign get up in the nosebleeds we'd always get on diamond vision maybe every fifth you know every fifth game they cut to us we rob Ducey was on our team at one point we made a sign that said getting Ducey with it got on went nuts made our whole year and uh I remember, you know, following Wade Boggs. I walked out, waited for an autograph. He grabbed my ball and just goes, just keep walking, follow me. And I followed him onto the bus. I walk on the bus. People were cracking beers. <laughs> he sits down and he goes, what was your name again? And he goes, shit, I already signed it. And he just handed it to me. And I was like, thanks, Mr. Boggs. And I'm walking off the bus by Mo Vaughn, all these guys. And like, 
And they're all just looking at me like, who's this little fat Jewish kid? And I get off the bus and I was like, that was incredible. I remember like getting a little older, going to the games, like, you know, a foul ball, an adult would catch a foul ball and we'd always scream, give it to a kid, give it to a kid. And we'd get people around us to bully this guy that would, uh, you know, give it to a kid. And most people were good about it. I'm big on that, you know. I mean, going to spring training in 95, I went, my dad was living there. I was uh, obsessed with autographs. And you're right, it's like, it makes a huge I mean, I was Huge getting, difference. you know, guys that you're just like, I never thought I'd even be two inches from their face and uh, are making time to do that. And it like, it almost like, you know, it's almost like a one up in Mario Brothers. You're like, I got another year of baseball investment because of this moment. Right. Yep. Um, do you have moments like that? For, or, sorry, you're going to say I something. still have them. Yeah. You know, it's a, it's a and I can flash back. I just told this story the other day. I, I grew up in New Jersey yeah. and I and I was a Met fan as a kid growing up. Oof. And, you know, it's there were some lean years there. But uh, so Mets know, Mariners World Series, you might have. Yeah, it'll it, I won't be torn. Wow. I can tell yeah, you yeah. that. But <laughs> yeah, okay, the, uh, you know, we had when I was when I was a young kid, the Mets had Tom Seaver and he was Mr. Everything. Oof. And and, uh, you know, it my brother and I both the, like our favorite player, he was like Elvis. And, uh, and then he got traded when I was like nine years old, he gets traded to the reds and it's a heartbreaking, and, devastating. And, but you know, along the way you, you, you know, like your heroes, you attach your yourself to your heroes mm -hmm. and, and you keep following the rest of his career while you're rooting for the, the Mets. And, yeah. and then I get to the, to the big leagues and I'm standing in Yankee stadium, my first trip into Yankee stadium. And, you know, and, and I've been there a number of times as a kid because my dad was a Yankee fan and he would take us to the cool. Yankee games. Uh, you know, if we were going to Met game, it had to be, it was in high school when I could go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, uh, you know, we go to the, we go to Yankee stadium and Tom Seaver is standing at, at the batting cage on the turtle watching BP. And he is, you know, for reasons I still can't quite comprehend, he does the color for the Yankees broadcasts, never played a day for the Yankees. You know, meanwhile, the, the Mets are at that time pretty good team yeah. and he's not even associated, yeah. but uh, that was later rectified. Wow. But I'm standing in the dugout and I'm staring at Tom Seaver on the turtle and a, and a former teammate of mine, a guy by the name of Eric Plunk, pitching the big leagues forever. Yeah. And, you know, Plunky comes walking over and he goes, D he, Riverside, California, straight Spicoli, the way he talks to <laughs> yeah, him. Yeah, yeah. He, he comes walking over and he goes, dude, just go out and say hello to the man. <laughs> You know, and I, and I said, I said, I'm not going to go talk to it. It's Tom Seaver. It'd be said, a lot cooler if you yeah. did. He yeah. said, bro, come on. He puts on his pants, same as you do. Yeah. Just, he said, grab a ball. Ask him to go sign a ball. And I said, you can do that. You know, and, and he said, yeah, I do it all the time. You know, it's a, wow. so I walk out to the cage, you know, I didn't grab a ball, but I walk out to the cage and I lean on it. I wait for him to finish his conversation. And when he's done, he, he turns around and, you know, I'm standing there in uniform, getting ready to stretch with the team. And I, and I reached out my hand. I said, Mr. Seaver, Jerry DePoto. I said, I am your number one fan. And, and he looks at me and gives me like the crooked head. And he goes, I've never heard that one before. <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I thought, I, I feel like a jerk. Yeah, you, know? And, yeah, and, yeah. Uh, you know, he talks to me for, for a moment, wishes me luck, and, and that's that. And, then, and I get back to the dugout. And Plunky said, dude, just go get the ball signed. And I said, I'm not going to get it signed, you know? So we get in the clubhouse after we do our pregame and such. Yeah. And, uh, and they, they, they take me to the clubhouse guy, you know, the clubhouse attendant. And yeah. He's, hey, do me a favor. Can you take this ball up to Tom Seaver and just have him sign it for the kid, you know, and me being the kid. Uh, and the guy says, yeah, yeah, I'll take care of it. <laughs> you know, he takes the ball and he throws it in a little brown bag and that's that. Well, we, we play the game, you know, the next day is getaway day and we roll out there and we get no hit by Jim Abbott. If you remember that moment in baseball, yes. history. it was just an that unbelievable was feat, you know, uh, uh, so unbelievable. Yeah. It was a crazy game. The switching of the mitt was already fucking like, and, the, and one of the greatest guys you'll ever meet. Oh, that's He's a awesome, truly dude. awesome person. So he no hits us. The game's over in what seems like 90 minutes. Yeah. And we're on a bus headed back home. It was actually rookie dress up day. So I am on a bus dressed like some weird amalgamation of the 1960s. I had like goldfish high, yes. you know, high heel shoes yes. on. And you know, I look like a character from Fat Albert. Yeah. And and uh, we're getting on the bus and I'm passing all my family members by, giving yeah, them hugs, looking yeah. like an idiot. And and uh, I never got the ball. So, you know, we go back to Cleveland and we were playing Thursday night baseball, uh, which at the time. Uh, yeah, ba -da, ba -da, exactly. Da. And we and Larry Sorensen yeah. comes walking up behind me and and uh, and he said, he said, Jerry, Larry Sorensen with ESPN. And I said, I said, the crew. 
He said, you know me? <laughs> and I said, yeah, Brewers, A's, Come you know. On, yeah. So, and, and he said, wow, most players now don't remember that. And I, I said, that's you know, nice to meet you. Yeah. And he said, hey, I brought a gift from a friend. And he gives me the little brown paper bag, and I open the brown paper bag, and in it is a ball, and it says, it says Jerry, best of luck in your career from your number one fan. Tom Seaver. And that, that ball still sits on a, in a very prominent position uh, on my, on my shelf back in my home office. Bro, that is an unbelievable yeah. story. It was great. It was great. Whole, wh I mean, when you, wait, when you took it out and saw that, were you just like, Oh, I almost, I almost peed my pants. I thought this is the greatest. Oh it, that my he God. was that thoughtful to, you and know, said from your number, wow. and he remembered what I said to him, you know, dude, that's so, crazy. Pretty cool. You, oh, man, see those stories, man, are just like, why this sport is so uh, in a category of its own. It truly is. It's just, I mean, there's baseball. I mean, I'm sure every there's, you know, you could pull a, a, a billion father sons about baseball and how it fuels their relationship. I mean, my, you know, dad and stepdad, it's a, a huge part of me. I'm considering staying. I'm supposed to go to the game tomorrow in Anaheim. I got tickets, but I might stay tonight just to watch with my stepdad and mom. Cause it's so fun to watch the games with them. Yeah. And I'm not, not coming back up here till, uh, till, um, well, it, I say like, I love being up here this time of year, uh, in general, but also it's like, Man, it's fun to be in the city when this is happening. When it's going, when it's vibing and like, like September, right now. like I haven't been, when I moved to LA in 2001, you know, that year was obviously incredible. And I watched it in my dorm room with buddies who were, um, you know, from, from Oregon and stuff who had, you know, Mariner ties. But uh, it's a, it's why, you know, Hanniger's um, Player Tribune thing last year was so, did you read that? Oh yeah. Yeah. Where, did you know of it? I didn't know of it until I read it. Yeah. yeah. And what then did, as a GM, what do you think when you see that? I mean, I don't know. You're, I was you, pumped yeah. actually, you know, and, and part of it is because at that moment, like so many, you know, we went through a lot of small dramas that you, you sometimes go through in seasons. Mm. And we went through a series of, of small dramas through the course of our rebuild, which really didn't last very long. Yeah. We, we were, we were rebuilt pretty quick and, and, you know, Mitch, what Mitch and Marco are really the only two players that have kind of spanned all of this. They were here when we were kind of good, but not good enough. Then they were here through the rebuild when it got lean for about a year and a half. Now they're here when we come out the other side. And what we talked about when we started the rebuild was investing and pouring in when the moment was right. And I love the fact that they stepped out and said, Hey, if this is not the moment, then when is the moment? Because we're a good team. And, you know, and we came to spring training this year and, you know, the leadership, the, the togetherness with this team was, it's never been better. And wow. it's true today. And, and I think that that letter ha drove a lot of that. Yeah. That sparked, you know, he and I became buds through Instagram because yep. of that. And, you know, uh, it's nice to also have, like, comedy in my pocket as far as, like, I mean, shit, it's how you and yeah, I have connected. It's laugh. awesome. Yeah. And it's, like, there's a mutual respect, I think, from, you know, uh, comedy, uh, athlete, what you guys are doing, what I'm doing, as far as just being so out of your world and you and mine, yeah. but also loving it and having a, and then don't be a piece of shit and you can make friends with anybody. Um, <laughs> Unique but, skill. If, yeah. You, you know? And so Mitch, you know, we started going back and forth about that and then comedy and other stuff and, and uh, great dude. And I was just like, I told him the, uh, the same way I think how I, I texted you um, shortly after we connected about like, you know, and I, I try to never be short on letting people know, like, you know, uh, and you always got to read the room and find the right moment to like, that's why even when I, you know, came up to initially just introduce myself to you at spring training, you were walking out with your uh, with your daughter and wife, and I was like, this isn't the time to be like, when I was a kid, <laughs> the Mariners were walking, you know what I'm saying? Pick and choose. It's hot as fuck. People are walking out. You're you're beeline and you're 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 looking at the gate, you know, so you don't go, Can you just stop? Hey, Mr. Napoto, I'm right here, you know? So there was a different time for that. But with Mitchell, I was like, I gotta let you know, man, that article, it was like just so timely and it got me so fired up and th that season and the, the way it finished was so incredible. I mean, like, uh, true um, um, in, in ways you just can't explain. And, um, uh, so it, it's, it's cool that they're, it's cool to see how many, again, like people in the city are just like dropping what they're doing to rally around something like this. Do you, I have to know, um, are you good on like another 15 or so? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. When, the, when you first got here, uh, and I think you've alluded to it a little bit. Um, is it, you know, because you'd been a GM then in um, uh, Arizona was your first one. You said, yeah, briefly, briefly, yeah. And then, and how was that? 
That was awesome. That did, which yeah. is why, you know, we talked, we were talking about the trade deadline. Yeah. So I, I was named the interim GM on July 2nd uh, of 2010. Mm. And the, the then owner, a still owner of the Diamondbacks, Ken Kendrick, he said, he said, nobody knows the personnel on this team better than you do. do go make our roster as good as you can make it for next year and beyond. Wow. And, and that was the instruction and, you know, roughly had, all right, the, the, I had an owner who wanted, he, he's got to approve whatever I'm doing, but he was giving me the keys to the car to work with our group and do whatever we thought was right for rare. the future. Super rare, you know, and, and, uh, especially for someone with no experience Holy doing it. Shit. And, uh, you know, we, we did it and pretty quickly the, the next year we wound up winning 94 games and, and we went to the, to the postseason and, and, uh, and that, Got me a full time gig in Anaheim as wow. uh, roughly that experience did. And, and, um, by the way, that should be a lesson to like, you know, just to equate it to like my world, like executives coming in and like trying to, it's what happened with Chappelle's show. He, you know, they, he got so big, they, they came in, he famously talks about it. They tried to then make decisions and do things instead of letting him do what he does. You do what you, you do. You hired him to do this thing, yep. and now you're trying to tell him how to do this thing when you don't do that thing. There's and it sounds easier said than done, but it's like proof is in the pudding. And then you you made the most of it, and you probably, I mean, because you had that freedom, I don't know if you were like, I'm going to take more chances, or did you second guess yourself? And I tried to do the right thing, yeah. and, and you know, that, which is kind of a, a, an ongoing theme. It's actually the only uh, the only rule that we've ever had is, hey, do the right thing. It's a be on time and do the right thing, mm. and. W- the right thing, I, I guess, as defined by what you'll know when you're doing it right or when you're doing it wrong. Right. And, and you know, inherently, even people who are predisposed to doing the wrong thing, they know which is the right. Totally. You know, and and that's what we talk. Which we preach it to our minor leaguers. We preach it to to the major league club. You know, when the kid asks for the autograph, just do the right thing. You know, when the runner's on first base and nobody's out. Do the right thing, you know, mm. get them over. And, yeah. and uh, if you're you know, running to home and, and they're, you know, holding you up and you like, you know, yeah. you think you can run through it. Like, Just do the right thing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and better be right. Yeah. But to, I, I think that's the, you know, the, 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 the thought process. And, and we, we broke down, we, we got some future prospect value. We got some, you know, some now major league help. And then we were able to, to create enough payroll flexibility to immediately address you know, the, the holes on the, the 2011 team yeah. and the team took off and, and did very well and, and then took those same concepts and, and brought them with me to Anaheim where yes. we had a star studded roster. Yeah, you were telling me, so you, you said you were, help, you brought help find Trout? Oh, I didn't help find it. No, he was, he, was, he was, yeah, he okay. was, when I got there, Mike was, was the already in the organization. Gotcha. So he was drafted in 09. I got there in November of 11, mm. but, uh, you know, my, my first year was Mike's rookie of the year. He was, you know, later, you know, multiple time MVP, yeah. uh, as it, greatest player I've ever seen. I was it's, just uh, say. it's, he is, uh, and, and just as good a person, I would say it's awesome. uh, a, a tremendous guy always had the time for everybody. Awesome. And, you know, I mean, he's the, he's the guy that signs the autograph for the kid. And, and I, and I watched this happen in Baltimore and the kid just breaks down, starts crying and <sighs> turns around, throwing his hands up. Like he just, you know, Rudy just, you know, yeah, and, and, uh, you know, his dad's picking him up and hugging him. And the moment that, that, that kid and his father had, and that he'll never forget in his entire mm. life because because Trout just walked over and said, I'm going to do the right thing. It's, That's uh, awesome. It's never lost on me when those things happen. Do you get extra excited when you're coming into an organization that has a player like that? A, just for selfish reasons of like, wow, I get to like watch. Just watch it every day. A leg- like this is just, yeah. you know, a rare thing. But but does it help or hurt in, as far as trying to build on top of that? Like, because you, I guess what I'm asking is you get there, what's the first thing you look at? Like what we have in our farm system is like trade assets. How do we, or what our holes are for the team, right? Is that the first? So the, the first thing you look at is there, how good is your major league club? You know, and at that time, Trout wasn't, you know, he wasn't prominent yet. We, right. We knew he was a great prospect, but sometimes great prospects don't turn into great big league players. Sure. And, you know, and you have to have, you know, I, I'll say it to our guys all the time. If you've got one, you need five. If you got five, you need 10 because they don't all turn out to be what you think or hope they'll be. Yeah. Um, you look at the major league club and you got to know that what is the balance between the, the expectation, the age of the team, the quality of the players and the payroll. You know, those are the, like the big four and you have to know what the owners are willing to spend, where the holes are on the club. How old are your core players? Because at the, you know, players universally, and this goes back to like Ty Cobb and Hunnis Wagner, players are having the best years of their careers 
in their, you know, let's call it from age 26 to 32. Sure. Those are the, the, that is the prime of a career really. And you know, if your, if your core players are on the back end of that, you're going to have a tough time building something sustainable. Mm. You know, it's a, you need, you know, you need to have your, a fair representation of younger players who are contributing to your core. And, you know, and, uh, you know, when I got to Anaheim, there were a lot of players that were already in that zone and a little later. Uh, and then all of a sudden Mike showed up and he was 20 years old and he was the best player in the league the day he stepped on the field and, you know, and he made it a hell of a lot easier to build a roster yeah. because, you know, it's, he's, he is so high impact and the, the relative hit to your payroll is so small yeah. that allowed us to do other things. And, you know, and, and the, the four years I was there, we actually did relatively well. We had a 98 win season. Yeah. We, you know, we went to the postseason, and won the West once. Uh, we got knocked out by a smoking hot Kansas City team. Oh but yeah, that was just it was uh, timing. It was it was most of it was fun, and yeah. you know, and uh, and I got for four years, I got to watch the best player you'll ever see. So when the opportunity comes to come to Seattle, how is that to even? Um, how does that transpire? Is it you you kind of know t- towards the end of the season that your time's going to be up there, and then you have to? Like, do they give you a heads up, and then other people, or do they tell? baseball so that like baseball's already calling you first like no that's when i resigned you know i resigned gotcha. to, oh exactly to the date in which i got my first opportunity in arizona it was like july 2nd crazy and i resigned and uh and just walked out and i went to work for the red sox as a consultant uh i had worked with the red sox during our world series year in, mm. in 04 Holy uh went shit. to work there i was there in 03 when we you know the 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 Aaron Boone, yeah, Tim Wakefield game, and just watching another like there's like twelve documentaries on that whole series. Yeah, it was amazing. The the whole experience was amazing. Wow, you know, I got to be there at the very start of Theo Epstein's, you know journey as wow. a GM and learn a guy? lot. I was just going to say. Yeah, I worked for him for his first two years. Holy and, shit, of course. Uh, yeah, he was great. He's, he's a, uh, I mean, I would put you guys both in this, like, He GM. taught me a ton. He, awesome. He taught me a ton. And, and, you know, our group at that time, you know, Theo Epstein and Josh Burns and Jed Hoyer and Ben Charrington, and th- it was like a host of guys that were going to go on, either were or were going to go on to become, you know, future general managers. And, yeah. And, uh, you know, and we were all working in the same place at the same time and, and bouncing ideas off each other. And everybody was so young, you know, at, at the time, I think I was 33, 34 years old and I was the veteran of the group in terms of birth certificate. Wow. The, the rest of them were all yeah. 28, 30. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. and, uh, you know, we, we had a, we had a blast, but you know, I, I went to work in, in 2015, I went to work for the Red Sox as a consultant, uh, with my friend Ben Sherrington, who, who at the time was running the Red Sox. And, um, you know, I, I went over there and as I, mostly I just, Hey, I'm, I need to, to decompress a little bit, but I love baseball and I want to be involved. I don't know where I'm going next. And, uh, and then, you know, the, the Mariners job opened up that September and, uh, and, you know, I got a call from, from the Mariners asking about my, my interest in it. And I, I came up and I interviewed and a couple of weeks later I was, I was the GM here. Wow. In the interview, I mean, how much of, of you is, uh, you know, absorbing the city and place to live as like a, you know, moving your family. That's, that's gotta be always a factor, right? Like in taking a job. But so this is going to be weird, right? Yeah. So in 2008, this is before I ever had an opportunity as a GM and, and, you know, Typically, when, once you've climbed those, you know, up the ladder, so to speak, yeah. you know, my, my first inquiry as, as a potential you know, candidate to be a general manager was from the Mariners in 2008. Oh, shit. Uh, and it was the year that they hired Jack. And, you know, I was, I was one of the finalists for that job, you know, when it went to Jack. And, Fuck, can we and, get a time machine, please, and go back? And- yeah, it was pretty awesome. The, 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 like the whole experience, I was up here three different occasions. I went through multiple levels and layers of interviews, you know, and, and truth be told, I actually, at the end, I thought I was getting the job and, uh, and my wife and I had already done all of our research. This is, you know, if we get there, this is where we want to live. It's a, the, the closest Dick's hamburgers is, uh, it was, in Queen Anne. <laughs> we, we did, we did a ton of work on it. And then ultimately I got a phone call from, uh, Chuck Armstrong mm. uh, telling me that they opted to go you know, with, uh, with a different candidate and, and, uh, wish me well. And, and uh, and they ultimately picked Jack. And Is that then, a bummer? Uh, it, yeah, it crushed me for a little while. But then the next it's down year, down to you and one person. How can it not? Yeah, be? you know, you're, you're right at that there. point. You're fantasizing about yep. it. 
And, uh, you know, and, and we had just come off of a big, you know, we were a postseason team in, in Arizona. We had the super young, fun yeah. core group. And, you know, it's we had a 24-year-old all-star at every position for, for you know, better yeah. or worse. And so it was fun to go back to my day job. And, and then the next year I interviewed with the Nationals. And, you know, when they opted to go with Mike Rizzo, mm. who's done a wonderful job sure. through the years. And, uh, and I didn't get that job. I was a, the, the, I was the, the one of two finalists for that gig and, and lost it. Um, and then, you know, finally the, the angel thing, I made it across the, hmm. you know, the, yeah. the finish line. Did you talk to Theo real quick? He was, he was the one who did the, made the Cubs, right? I'm not. Yeah. Ma- made the what? The, the, when the Cubs won the World Series. Oh That's yeah, Theo, yeah. Right. Yeah, okay. Theo. I just want to make sure I was like, yeah. I he did that, the Red Sox and the Cubs. That's right. That's curse breaker. Right. That's right. Curse breaker. Uh, did you talk to him? I was in, <clears throat> I was flying to Philadelphia to do stand up, and game seven was happening that night. And it was the fifth, and I landed in Chicago uh, to change plans to go to Philly. And in my head, I was like, I was just going a day over to do press for the shows. And I was like, I'm in Chicago, and they could win. I could go to Wrigleyville and party. I've never, like, this, this feels like a, what, yeah. what am I doing going to radio? I was like, I should cancel my flight. I look up at the screen, it says canceled from weather. I was like, get the fuck out. I call my buddy who lived there. We go to a bar. We go, the game happens. We go to Wrigleyville, Wrigleyville and partied until like six, seven in the morning. I saw people jumping on people's cars and the people in the cars were like high-fiving <laughs> them. Just, Every yeah, stranger crazy, was hugging. Yeah. It was like, it truly was a glimpse. Like, you know, that Nicolas Cage family man movie oh, yeah, where yeah, he gets yeah. a glimpse of a like yeah. different life. I was like, whoa, if every day could be like this, there nobody would ever have any problems or stress because truly like, I saw people like puking on people, but then being like, "You okay?" Give him a hug. <laughs> yeah, it was like let's take that, bring him in, get him a, you know, get him a, a towel, and then get him a shot. Like it was just the most supportive commute, like all because of what had just happened. I've never to this day seen anything like it. I think that you know, on some level, some version of that will happen here because it's the a people have been waiting yeah. for so long. Well, that's why I was curious if like you talked to him after, and I don't know if you could. Cause you're, you know, you're, you're, you're in the thick of it at this point. Like, and I don't know if you remember hearing in his voice or something that made you go like, cause it did for me as a fan being around that. I was like, fuck dude, we're going to get that here and it's going to be crazy. So I don't know if you were talking to him. Did you get some sort of like, well, we experienced that very thing in Boston. Oh, that's right. Okay. That's right. Yeah. So we all lived through it okay, in yeah. that moment. And like the people, the, the people, you know, 80, 90 year old people breaking down and crying, you know, like 40 year old man and his, and his son, like in, in tears yeah. standing out in front of Fenway park. What it's, the fuck? Uh, it's craziness. And that's, uh, the, the, like the joy that runs through people's minds, but the, like, it's not lost on me, the historic value of those totally. things. I, I, I remember I was on the, the disabled list at one point at toward the end of my career. And I was playing for buddy bell in mm. Colorado and uh, so this is my last active year as a player. And and we're in Chicago where I did through the years, like there are your, there are ballparks you crush it in and there are ballparks you do not like the opposite where we're because of what, I, whatever the environment is yeah. like, you could send me out to pitch in like, you know, at, at the Olympic stadium in Montreal or at the vet in Philly on, and I was a sinker baller on turf fields. They should not mess with me. Yeah. And I crushed it at those yeah. places but send me into Wrigley Field and it's like my personal house of horrors. It's a, you know, I just suck there. And, you know, we're, I'm on the, the DL and I'm going through some rehab stuff and, and I finish up my morning work and I throw a bullpen session. And, uh, you know, Buddy was great. And Buddy was my, when I was coming up through the minor leagues with the Indians, Buddy was our infield coordinator. Mm. So I'd known Buddy for, you know, all my career yeah. to that point. And, uh, and I went in his office and I said, hey, I don't know how many more times I'm going to ever be in Chicago. You mind if I just throw my jeans on and go sit out in the in the bleachers with the with the nice. the, the people and just see, see what, what it's like. like? Yeah. And he said, "No, no, go for it." You know, and I so I I threw on a t-shirt and some jeans and I I went out and I watched the game from the bleachers with the fans and it was a an unbelievable. Yeah. You know, even then and the and the Cubs at that time were just okay, mm. you know, but it was the like the Sammy Sosa years oh, it was shit. electric and the fans are, you know, he's doing his little circuit around yeah. the outfield and the oh, fans yeah. were crazy. It was it was a blast. Um, you told me at the Paramount about uh, Julio Rodriguez. We'll edit in some fucking cheers. Um, thanks, Blake and Isaac. Just got quiet. Julio, Rod- yeah, there we go. Um, I mean, <laughs> yeah. Uh, you told me at the Paramount about he was the first player you signed when you got here. He was, right? 
He was our first. So the first international class uh, that we had an opportunity with was the 2016 class. Okay. And Julio was our headliner in wow. that group. Um, Tim Kisner was our then uh, director of international, and and uh, you know Julio was well regarded, uh, but not uh, he wasn't considered the top guy in gotcha. this class. I, I think that narrative has changed yes. in the years since. Before we get on uh, finding him, discovering him, seeing all that, when you okay, so just once you get the M's job, is there? Um, are you just, do you have a clear cut? Like, I know what the plan of attack is. Now we just got to execute it. Cause it feels like that's kind of what's happened in hearing you talk right out of the gate on, on shows and, and podcasts. I was just like, Oh, this guy fucking has like a true game plan. And it seems like it's all come to fruition more or less. And the moves that have been made and, 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 and at least, and you know, there's always people that are, go, Oh, that we shouldn't do that. Or we should do that. And, and people, I'm one of those people <laughs> yeah. is, uh, what I guess just, I'm asking when you first got here and you sat down and you, I don't know if it's in T-Mobile park, uh, and you're looking out and you're like to get, you know, you know what you want. What is the, is it like a big blueprint or is it like, all right, let's just start knocking down, like doing what I did in, in Anaheim and Arizona, but with this, uh, Obviously, every place, different circumstances, more prospects, maybe more. Uh, you have more of one thing and less of another. Like, was it clear cut or was it overwhelming? So, you know, then, and it was at T-Mobile, set, I sat with our ownership group when mm -hmm. I went through, the, like, the final stages yeah. of the interview. And you lay out, here's my plan. Uh, and you're looking at the roster. And at that time, our roster, we, we had, you know, Felix was coming off of what wound up being, like, the, the last great Felix year. Yeah. And, uh, you know, he had Cano coming off of, we were in the midst of, big years when he first got to Seattle. Oh yeah. Nelly Cruz was, was, I think this was year two of, of what wound up being maybe the best free agent contract the Mariners ever signed. 1000%. Uh, and Kyle Seeger just, Kyle Seeger was maybe two years into what I would call, you know, going from a nice big league player to a, an impact major league mm. player. And, you know, those, you know, that core four, made up the the bulk of the the roster yes. and the payroll yeah. and and uh you know so i laid out a plan for them right, here's how this team with a you know and, and i one of our owners still jokes with me to this day i said this team with a few turns of the screw can be really competitive and i said we'll build it up i said i think we have a two three year window to compete highly with this team but with what I talked about earlier, based on the, you know, the, all those guys were already in their, their young to sure. mid thirties. So you, you know, it's going to start timing out and we didn't really have much in the way of a minor league system at the time. So, you know, I, I here's what we're going to do. And over these next two or three years, that's our window to try to win this. And, you know, and while we're doing that, we'll just start working under the hood in the draft and international mm. building up the, the lower levels. And, and we did both of those things. You know, we, we, in two of those three years, we narrowly missed the, the postseason. Yeah, dude. Um, and which it, you probably didn't realize your goal because you missed it. But, you know, at at the end of the third year, I went back in. And we were just coming on. You may remember, you know, at the end of 2018, we were coming off of an 89-win year where, you know, it's one of the six or eight highest win totals in the history of the organization. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, we've had – two winning seasons in three and even in in 2017 the midseason we were okay you know it was a uh, we were we were beat up and banged up but yeah. we stayed in it until the end yeah and uh you know and, and then at the end of that 89 win season i walked into the same owners who i'd met with before and i said now we have to turn the screw in the other direction and break this down and 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 build up around a younger core is that a, otherwise we're going to time out is that a tough thing to a pill to swallow or is it just like like you said, it's the right thing to do. Yep. So I have no doubts about it. We just, knew, you know, at that time that this was the right thing to do. Yep. Uh, now it's another thing entirely when you're trying to tell an ownership and a fan base, you know, Hey, I know we just won 89 games and I know it, we, it looks like we have stars on the field, but this isn't going to work out. We need to, to just a redo. Yeah. And, um, to the credit of our owners, you know, at, at a couple of days of contemplation, they, they were with us, they pushed in and, and, uh, the way we expressed doing it was that if we do this the right way, again, it was targeting a certain 
age group of mm. players. If we do that the, this the right way, we could flip this in two or three years and we don't have to go through the like painful long rebuild wow. where you're picking near the top of the draft and you know it, and and lo and behold, you know by by September of 2020, you know since since September of 2020, we got like the fourth best record in the American League, which is crazy to think <laughs> yeah. about because we were a rebuilding team. Yeah. Right? And, you know, that's how quickly these guys came to the big leagues and started to make an impact and and just magic started happening. It's also crazy to me that in hearing you talk uh, since you the, this rebuild started, uh, giving kind of an, an expiration date, like saying, I think it was a, around this time when 2023 even were yeah. those years. We, we actually, when this started, so it started, you know, 2018. Yeah. We said our goal is to be back in contention to go to the postseason in 2021. And, uh, you know, along the way, we didn't expect, you know, a global pandemic to, to shorten us up a little yeah. bit. But, uh, you know, it's you can comfortably say we did contend in Hell 21. Yeah. Uh, and and the goal is that, that this is the end and we can get over the, the hump. So you see Julio, you're like, all right, this kid's a stud. But not he's not getting regarded in the way that um, that I'm sure now people who you know just the way it always goes. Right? I'm sure there's people now. Oh, he's who, one of the new faces of baseball. A thousand percent. Uh, yeah, he's electric. Uh, but did you what he's doing now? You could see that then. Just it's just like you said. It's so tough to really project, right? So you can go, oof, this looks good, but who knows until you get to the show. See, we we didn't actually the things he's doing now. When we signed Julio, he was a center fielder. Uh, Big bone kid that, that just kept getting bigger. I mean, he's, you get on top of Julio, he is a big man. Yeah, and it's like what six? A, he's about six four, Damn. you know, and it's it, and he's chiseled and and uh, you know at the time it, he was he was a sixteen year old kid with big bones and and you're trying to to forecast what it's going to look like down the road and our general take was it's going to be a right hand power bat probably more power than hit and he's going to wind up playing on a corner mm. where he's got the tools to be a really good corner player and then uh you know we were going into this season you know julio's coming to his second major league camp he's played you know some center field more corner outfield than anything else in in recent years and uh, but julio's julio's smart and he's he's looking at our roster and he knows that the pathway to to everyday play is in center field and he said to me do you think i can play center field you know and, and this was in the off season yeah. and he said do you think i can play center field i said ah you know it's it'll be fun to watch you to, to watch you go out and do it yeah. right so he goes home and he gets to his credit he gets with his trainers he has his own uh, training group and that, that work with him through his representatives mm. uh, and and he's had the same group since he was 15 years old so he's got his hitting coach he's got his his trainer and he goes and transforms his body he's a, he he went out and worked with a sprint coach and he turned himself in when the off season began on a grading scale. You would have had Julio as a 50 runner, mm. you know, like an average yeah. to 55 runner. Yeah. You know, this year he's one of the six fastest runners in the big leagues. You know, he <laughs> went from a 50, 55 to like an 80 and uh, on an 80 four. scale at six, four. You just don't he, think of guys that big to be that no. fast. No, And then he went, he went and made himself a center fielder where now it's a, like, he's a legitimate, like, gold glove quality yep. center field. Oh yeah. He still throws like a right fielder and uh, like all of the elements they brings to the table, the, the base stealing, the, the, you know, the impact his speed has, has uh, you know, imparted on the game. We could have never imagined that. And, uh, and in spring training, I think I shared this story with yeah. you. I'm, I'm sitting down Please, with him yeah. and, and he said, uh, he, he said, you know what I thrive on Jerry? I thrive when people tell me I can't do something. That's when I thrive. Do you think I can play center field? You know, and he asked me the yeah, same question yeah, yeah. he asked me a couple of months before, and I and I said, eh. I said, unfortunately for do, for you, I do think that you can play center field. I said, but you know what? I don't think you can do. I don't think you can do thirty thirty or the triple crown. <laughs> you know, and and uh, and he looks at me and he grabs his bat and he looks up at the bat and he goes, "It's on." <laughs> and he got up and went out and started taking BP, and, and lo and behold, he's on on pace to do he's thirty thirty now. You know? Holy shit! Like dude. that twenty one. Wow, dude. You wow, man, that's crazy. He uh, the joy is something everybody talks about too. Like the, I think it is once in a generation to see a guy like you said that, you know, has turned into a Gold Glove center fielder with a right field arm that, uh, you know, that that is as fast as he is, being as big as he is. So to have all that is great, and that would be enough. But to be an impact player, like you said, I'm sure. You know, you you feel it when he's not there. 
that there is something missing. And that is, that's just not on the page as far as like, it's like when any great comedic actor, you're like, yeah, he's got his lines, but like what Jim Carrey did in Liar, Liar, in Liar, Liar, it's just, it's not on the page. He brought yeah. something else. Julio Effect has that in baseball where it's like he's doing things that you just uh, aren't, I don't want to say expected, right? But just um, they transcend, yeah. You know, and when and 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 uh, more eyeballs, more. Uh, I'm sure when he's up to batter on the base, uh, on the bases, like the entire opposing team is just a little more, whether it's nervous or whatever, right? They're just a little more. Fuck! All right, he's there's a chance he could just steal all three bases in one uh, in one move. You know, like you have to be more on your toes, right? And you can't walk away. You know, it's a like there are certain players when they're doing something on the field. If you know, if Julio's in the batter's box, if he's on the bases, you you don't look away. It's a, and it's, I could say the same thing about Junior when he was playing. Mm. And uh, you know, somebody once asked me what the you know what the what it was like playing against Junior. And I played against him some. Uh, you know, we were interleague at the time, yeah. or my first two years in the American League, yeah. I, I played against him some, and like the the thing that you you saw with junior on the field a is you know maybe the most talented player of his generation sure. and one of the best players of all time now that we look back on it and you knew that in the time but he had a way of just making cool happen no matter where he went you know from the that backward hat to the you know to the smile on his face all the time to the guy that could walk in and out of the the other team while they're stretching like you know high-fiving guys and talking to whoever it could be the utility player or it could be your star so everybody like he he had that, yeah. and everybody he had that wanted vibe. to, yeah. yeah. And he knew who he was, so he was like, "Let me spread it around. Let me yeah. say, I'm sure that it'll make that guy's day if I give him a high five." And Julio right? has that, you know, he, he truly does. And I, we saw it at the at the All Star game, you know, the, the like the the stars of the game that typically wait for you to come pay homage to to their greatness. Yeah, they went to try to find him, you wow. know, like to 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 introduce themselves. Hey, I've been watching you play. I love the way you do it. You know, that's. It's just just the engagement, and I think it's uh you know it's it's really reflective of of how much joy he shows when he plays, and and it's it's super genuine. I, I'll, I'll share this too because Please. I think it's awesome. Yeah. And, you know, we we were talking through, uh, we're having a, t a meeting you know, in the dur during the course of the season. We're talking about you know loving what you do mm. and and you know just get in dig in have some passion to play and you know some some of the veteran players shared thoughts you know scott some of the staff members shared thoughts and and uh, you know julio's he's he's a baby he's you know 21 yeah. he's got at this time he's got you know a month and a half of major league experience and he's just now starting to you know to catch his his groove yeah. and, and get some traction it's crazy on the, the field this soon yeah and uh and somebody asked him you know julio what do, what are you thinking and usually the the player in that scenario will just shrivel up and cower in a corner and he he stood up and he said you know what i get to do what i love to do every day i really am living the dream man just come and have fun and play you know and he just grabs his glove and that's it that's and he's and he is genuine when he says that he he truly does just love that's it. not like a great fun yep. answer for the moment it's like yep. he's this is just who he is to him. he's who like he is. it's fucking fun yeah, yeah, dude. I mean, even the last night's game, I'm sure you're watching, right? When when um, he and Mitch, um, you know, collided for that. Yeah. Uh, when you're watching that, are you just? Is it just like, ah, damn it, or is it like? Oh no, my heart stopped and thinking, yeah. oh my god, it's our two best players <laughs> colliding. Bro, and, yeah, 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 a thousand percent. I even saw like when Mitch came down, they cut away. I saw him like do a little turn, and then they cut, away, you know, just the way they cut, cut back to the infield, and I was like, oh sweet god, because yeah. they did kind of please come out of this totally. Yeah. But then what was great, and I'm sure you saw this too, they were back in the dugout you know, conferring about what happened. And it was such a, they both were laughing and not like, you know, that was like, it, it didn't, it didn't make you mad. Like you gotta be serious. It was a home run, you guys, but they, you could see they hash it out even like, you know, and it was very serious and then they smiled and whatever. And it was like, and, and that just, again, uh, you know, played into me thinking of, of what you said about um, Carlos Santana and, and saying that this has got to be fun. So yeah. it's like, but I'm sure that moment, even is is why the team is so gelled and having success where it's like okay cool fucking that was not ideal what happened cool fucking let's say what you need to say and yeah, then let's go on. have fun get back yeah. to it that's right baseball really and you can probably speak to this you know uh as good as anyone i feel like has probably got and sports in general in life right are so just synonymous but like the and again, I think it was you talking uh, the other day about uh, Eugenio uh, Suarez uh, t saying something about like how he just literally like has the ability that baseball players have and, and, and 
I think you maybe said about how good his ability to just move on from something yeah. good or bad. Yeah. And I feel like, man, I could, I would love some more of that in my life. And I think everyone, but Wouldn't baseball, yeah, totally. Yeah. But, but you, I'm sure also possess it. And like it, uh, how essential is that to a, to a player? I think it's huge. Julio has that trait, you know? And so then I will say, you know, every great closer, has that trait, you know, they're able just to move past it and, and go on to the next thing. And, you know, there's a, there's a great quote and I'm going to botch who, you know, who actually said it, um, ages ago, yeah. but the, the quote is, you know, no man will ever step in the same river twice because Sounds the right. man's not the same and the river's not the same. Yeah. That's the baseball season. You will never, ever step in the same river again. It's a, the, the, the ebbs and flows, the pitch types, who you're facing, the scenario on the field, you know, whether you're going good or you're going bad, it changes every day. And, you know, you'll never, no matter how long you play, you're never going to, you're never going to experience the same season yeah. or even the same day. It's, it's just, it's something new every day. And the players who are able to understand that yesterday happened, and just move on and, and just go have fun doing it without putting undue stress on yourself or mm. wearing the failures. Yeah. You fail a lot in baseball. I mean, it's a, it's tr truly, you know, three for 10 and you're good. It's a, if I, there's no way, no one has actually ever thrown a perfect game because that would be, you know, yeah. 27 pitches yeah. <laughs> and, and, you know, get them all out. It's yeah. a, there's, there is no perfection. It is, you're going to make mistakes. You're going to make errors and you need to know when to, or how to move past it and not tether yourself to your past failures. And Gino, I think is a great example of that. I connect with that man in the river. Uh, it's never the same. Like when I get a little stony blown and go to Seven Eleven at 2 a.m., I'm getting a different flavor Slurpee every time I every go. Every time. Sometimes it's, it's never the same. Cherry. It's never the same. <laughs> and you need that variety. Um, all right, we got to wrap this up. This, is, this has been unbelievable, by the way. I really That's appreciate fun. you taking fun. time. It was good. Yeah. I had, I had a blast. Time. I had a blast. I don't know how many of these like that where there's, you know, I try to, uh, you know, keep it as light as possible. But I mean, you again, you talk baseball so much, but uh, it's really, again, uh, I just start crying. It's uh, it's really great to to know that we have somebody at the helm that like gives a shit as much as you do and really loves it. And it's like truly trickled down to every, I mean, I was talking about this on stage this weekend about like, you even see it in the concession guys, the way they're, do they a little, they put a little extra on, a, on throwing <laughs> a bag of peanuts and you see some kid with a mouthful of braces, just fucking take one off the cheeks and he's, you know, got some dripping blood and, but it's like, everyone's a little more fired up and it's like, it's why I love living in LA for what I do because, uh, and you know, I, my mom's always like, you gotta move back here. You could do stand up here. I'm like, I feed off the energy. You know what I'm saying? I, I feed off the energy of being around a, the, all the, the great comics down there and, and being on shows with them. But like even being at a Jamba Juice and meeting some kid that's like, Oh man, like we both, and seeing some kid, we both auditioned for something and he's there and I'm here and I'm like, bro, I was just there. And like, I could be back there in two months if things don't. So it's, um, you know, it, it's it, it's uh, it's great what you've created. I guess is what I'm trying to say. I appreciate Thank it. It's, um, it's been a blast. All right, a few more things, uh, and then we'll wrap this up. Um, I had some few notes here. Let's see, uh, the GMs. I see a home. Uh, oh, um, oh, 93. So May 11th, 93 was your uh, the your debut. Yeah. in the big leagues. Um, and you spoke to that a little bit. I want to tell you also what was happening in 1993. I don't know if you can, um, uh, if you remember any of this. Dragon the Bruce Lee story was at the top of the box office on that day. Just, I'll buy this. I'll buy it. Uh, the next day, uh, the last episode of The Wonder Years aired. I did not have that one. Yeah. I wasn't a big Wonder Years guy. Yeah. You know, because it, it happened. I was already off to, to school by the time it, it got kicking. Yeah. You know, I, was, I was in my high school and college oh, years yeah, when yeah, I wasn't. Yeah, yeah, so not, yeah. I'm a little above it. Was, uh, <laughs> the, uh, the Western Zodiac or Sun Sign of a Person born on May 11th is Taurus. Wow. Is that what you are? No, I was born on May 24th. I'm Gemini. I'm a God, crossover. I'm a Gemini too. Yeah, that's me. Do Gemini, I had a friend once say that like, oh, Gemini's are, too, you guys are two-faced. Yeah, a little duplicitous. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And there's a good side. And there's a, You have like a party side, but you have a chill side. And um, I think that's pretty consistent. It says rooster is the mythical animal and water is the eastern element of a person born on May. Oh, you said May 20th. I was born on May 24th. Let's move on from this segment, Jerry. Um, <laughs> your total stats, win-loss, 27 and 24. Does that sound about right? Sounds right. Uh, a 405 ERA. That's right. And 352 strikeouts. There's 
That I can't say for sure, but I, I do remember. I kind of like that you don't know your own stats. Yeah, I know the ERA. That I'm familiar with because I was working my ass off to try to get it back under four after the four years in oh, Colorado. Yeah. It was a little, a little dicey. Um, how fired up are you for the All-Star game to be here? Is Pumped. That, yeah. It's a, you know, the, the, mostly because the experience for the city you know, the All-Star game is going to be played no matter. You know, I love watching it on TV. Yeah. The, the, the derby, all the extra stuff is so much fun. But what happens to the city around the All-Star game? Yeah. It's just it, the whole summer. We did it in, in Arizona back in 2011. Mm. Yeah. Um, I was fortunate enough to, to be there for that. And when the, the whole city just, it, it's it's vibrant yeah. for the year around the All-Star game. It's unbelievable. It's almost like a weird reward for what you've done because to have the team be where we're at and to have that like the timing is crazy yeah it's great i'm honestly right now you know pinching ourselves from you know what's happening with our, our fun young team watching this group you know kind of elevate themselves the, the being awarded the all-star game for next year mm. the fact that they expanded postseason to to create the potential for you know that uh, i gotta say like I, our goal is to we don't think we we are in a position to be able to catch the Astros based on where we are sure. in the calendar and we don't play them anymore. Yeah. But our goal is to win that first one so that we can have a three game set. <sighs> How about a three game set where it's three games, best out of three, and all three games are in your ballpark. Holy shit. And what we have in our ballpark now. So our interest level isn't in finding our way into the postseason. It's making sure that we get the first wild card seed. And you know the 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 chances for that to happen have never been better yeah. and you know for all this to be crescent at the right time i pinched myself most days. Forty thousand plus i mean even yeah. those th that week uh that weekday yankee series i mean you're t i mean that that energy and environment in this time of year um i know uh it's you know not uh, directly connected but i think we uh went 22 and 4 after my first pitch on june 16th so i'm just saying if i should come back if things you know if we take a little dip what are you doing on yeah. tuesday yeah yeah, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. um yeah, man, it's uh, it's exciting. Well, and so you're gonna try to go to as many games on this stretch as possible. I mean, every home game you're at, you told me. Yeah, I go to every home game. Uh, I was at the the series in Texas. I flew back just for you yeah. to to be back God here for this. You, dude. Yeah, big time. I owe you. And then I'll I'll be on each of the rest of the trips. T typically, I try to go on one out of every three. Cool. Uh, just so that you're you're there, you show your face, but the you know you're there to answer questions. And and most I just love going to the ballpark. Yeah. You know, it's 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 a blast. Last question: What would your walk up song be? Uh, I had one. And I, I had one. It was I, it was I want to live by the Ramones was my walk up song awesome. uh, back in the day. It's uh, and and um, I, I I can remember because when I first got to the big leagues they didn't have walk up songs, and what a uh, bummer. Yeah, it, it would just be it was a new thing that was just evolving at the time. And I the 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 first time I came running out of the bullpen we were in Milwaukee Old County Stadium playing the Brewers, and they're bringing me in with the bases loaded and Robin Yount is hitting. And I'm thinking like, oh my God, you know, there, yeah. there's, I've been in the big leagues for like a month and, and now I'm coming into these situations and we got like a one run lead and Robin Yount at the plate with bases jammed. And, and, uh, as I'm running out of the bullpen, I'm a big Ramones fan. Yeah. I'm running out of the bullpen and they start playing, you know, I want to live yeah. on the, which is not your normal bullpen, mm -mm. you know, ballpark song. Yeah. And they start playing it. And I took that first step out of the, the dugout to start to jog into the field and the song starts. And I thought, Oh, you're playing the wrong song. <laughs> yeah. And I, and I got to the mound and I got out of it and, and we wound up winning the game. And, and then when they allowed you to start adopting your own kind of walking mm. songs, that's, I, I, I chose it. Amazing. That's the uh, first thing I thought about when I got, to a game as a kid. I was just like, what was my song? Griffey had Hip Hop Array. You know, I, I think I probably would have picked Return of the Mac or maybe Casey and JoJo's, you know. <laughs> close to me like my mother. Close to me like some R&B. I love that Haggerty's going with the... Uh, oh, the Godfather is amazing. Pretty crazy. Yeah. It's so, like, unexpected, you know? like That, Russ, that is Sam Haggerty. He, he is he's unexpected. That kid. Yeah. yeah, okay, yeah. Because I remember, like, Russ Davis, you know, when we had him in the 90s with, with Sweet Home Alabama, Jay's Bad to the Bone. I mean, some yep. just were just so obvious. See, that's when it started, was, the, right. was that group of players. That, right. they're, they're, you know, that was my generation. I would love people. somebody to just do like, you know, like one of my karaoke go-tos is the Pepto-Bismol theme song. It's very catchy. <laughs> Nausea, heartburn, indigestion, upset, stomach, diarrhea. <laughs> like I'm waiting for somebody to just walk up to a, a commercial tune. But it's, you know, again, because you can do whatever you want, right? You pick whatever you want. Yeah. Wow. Nobody says no to the, to the players. They, they, they do what they want. They do what they want. Um, 
Share this is amazing. You're not. Are you on? Do we plug your social medias? Are you on the gram? No, I don't. Do, you know, I don't. I don't do Twitter. There's a. I do, as Twitter. A, I do Instagram. You do I, Instagram, all right? But mostly as a private thing, just to track my kids. Okay, and see great. what they're doing. You know, <laughs> great. Yeah, that's so, it. Yeah, that's all you need it for. Yeah. Um, can't wait to uh, to enjoy the rest of the season. Thanks for making time. You're a legend, and and uh, truly, man. I, hopefully, we will soon be erecting the uh, Depoto statue outside of T-Mobile. There's and if we did do that, what? And you had a choice of the pose. What would it be? Uh, probably the little green soldier who talks on the walkie-talkie because it was the most uninteresting of the Green Army men. Yeah, but. One of the, it, I will ever forever remember that, that was post. your favorite. That's a, I want to be the one sitting there with the little walkie talkie saying, yes, make the trade, make the trade. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Jerry DePoto. Thanks brother. You got it. Mmm. Zoa. Thanks rock guys. Adam Ray here for the about last night podcast. Hope you enjoyed that episode. It was a good one. A lot of laughs, a lot of tears, a lot of, uh, stuff to uh to think about and chew on huh because that's what life's all about chewing on the good stuff nobody said that maybe denzel did maybe tom hanks did maybe they said it together in philadelphia the point is click subscribe right here on the aln logo so you can get more episodes and stay up to date when new content drops highlights animations clips it's all here for you baby i'll see you next time well i don't know how to blink